It's 8 a.m. and that means it's time for only one thing. Heroes of the Spider Woods. The beginning. Okay, some background. Our party consists of a wild sorcerer, a paladin, two fighters, a ranger, and a monk. We all met in the tavern and were offered a quest. We must head to the enchanted elven woods to retrieve a golden cup from it. By elven, I mean they were elven once. The only elves that live in there now are ghosts, zombies, and an occasional cursed fellow. First off, we do some starter quests in the town, nothing too major. We drive off murderous crows and a magic scarecrow from a farm. We take part in a pie-eating competition. We help a blacksmith to clear his basement from corrupted myconoids, and that sort of stuff. All of this done to gain the trust of the local population, and by extension, the local druids. Soon, we earn their trust, but they only tell us they can't help us find the cup at all, since they're not diviners. But there's an exiled druidess in the woods who may know such magic, so we head there. Here, our DM introduces his homebrewed travel system. There's a hex map of the forest, and each time we move a tile, we must roll the survival check. If we fail, he hides all the map from us and then rotates it randomly, so we're forced to remember the landmarks. Luckily, this never actually comes into play, because we have a ranger with us. In fact, we're acting unusually smart for our artistic selves for once, since we do not get lost. In fact, we find the witch's hut pretty early. Maybe a little too early. The hut is there alright, but the witch isn't home. Her guard dog is, though, and it starts barking the moment it sees us. One of our fighters decides to distract it with tasty treats and petting, while the rest decides that the home invasion is a really great idea. We find nothing especially interesting inside, at least nothing we wouldn't expect to see in a druid's hut. Just some basic furniture, a shelf with potions, and a heavily wounded unconscious deer. We barely restrain ourselves from stealing the potions in the witch's absence for five minutes before she arrives. She doesn't take kindly to the intruders at first. In fact, the only reason she decided to listen to us at all is because her dog liked our fighter. Every party member tries to ask her for help in his own way. The paladin appeals to honor and glory of finding a sacred relic, but the witch doesn't hold much love for her order or religion, so she fails. The other fighter asks if they could help her back, but the witch is pretty self-sufficient. She doesn't need anything from murder hobos. When everyone tried their hand, the monk steps in. He pulls a myconid corpse from his pocket. Maybe we could make a deal. Look, I have this. Maybe you could plant him and grow yourself an army, right? The paladin freezes in horror. The sorceress pulls a hood down on his face. The ranger covers his ears. The fighter covers the dog's ears. There's a dead silence in the air for a few seconds, until the witch starts screaming insults and obscenities at us. She polymorphs the monk into a newt and throws him into the bushes with all her strength. Then she stares at us. She continues yelling at us for another five minutes or so, calling us all brain-dead imbeciles and worse, until she finally calms down and gets it out of her system. After successfully deflecting all the blame for a home invasion and bringing a corrupted myconid to the forest on the monk, we manage to finally start a reasonable discussion. She even agrees to help us in order to get rid of murder hobos at her hut the easy way. There's a catch. In order to divine the location of the cup, she needs to perform a blood sacrifice that is likely to significantly cripple one of us. But then again, she also offers us the easy way out. We could simply use the dying deer as a sacrifice and be done with it. Luckily, our paladin is always happy to martyr herself for no reason at all. She steps forward and offers her blood instead. Good choice, because it turns out that the witch was bullshitting us in order to find out and see if we were sociopathic enough to murder a defenseless animal to find some bejeweled crockery. We are totally not. So she finally caves and begins to explain the situation. First of all, the forest is divided into three areas of influence. One is controlled by a gigantic minotaur, the other by a hag, and the other is under control of the necromancer. 
Well, that sounds pretty spooky, but we don't actually need to visit all those places, right? She can just find the location of the cup and we'll head there. Nope, she can't. This magic is beyond her. Fuck. That is, unless we find a magic mirror for her. Yes. The magic mirror is located in the hands of the titanic minotaur mentioned above. Fuck. Alright, fine. We're adventurers. We should be able to handle a minotaur, right? After our monk recovers from polymorph, since the witch refuses to dispel it herself, <laughs> we head out. Minotaur's lair is located in the western part of the forest. As the witch told us, goblins serve him, just like Grimlock served the hag, so we should be careful. Naturally, when we hear be careful, we understand it as get caught in a goblin ambush. For someone of such low CR, goblins managed to put up some resistance, but we went anyway, killing the majority of the fuckers and capturing a few alive. The paladin decides that she has a huge and important business somewhere else while the rest of the party interrogates the greenskins. Turns out they really are the servants of the Minotaur, but we already know that. We probe the fuckers for more information until we learn something new. First of all, goblins assume that we're here to save some huntsmen that we never heard about before. More importantly, the Minotaur has a very unusual pet. A gelatinous cube. Well, it's difficult to call him a pet. He's just trapped him in a tunnel and uses him as a guard. We asked him about how they managed to contain the cube. We are told that it's afraid of fire, so they've surrounded it with torches to keep him still. After learning everything that we need, hold up. How do you gender a gelatinous cube? It's like a giant gelatinous cube like pocket or protrusion? How's it a him? Is it self-identified? These are the questions we need to know. <laughs> After learning everything that we need, we let them go. Grab the paladin and head to the Minotaur's lair. Since our paladin is the only one with dark vision, she decides to walk to the front to scout in heavy armor. This genius idea works out just fine. When we walk into the cave's living room and wake up about 20 goblins or so, we're totally fucked, aren't we? Well, luckily, they aren't all waking up at once, so we're fighting a wave after wave, not a gigantic army. That is, for a few rounds, until they all wake up, and we are fighting a gigantic army. We end up blowing all of our daily resources on a single encounter. We end up blowing all of our hit points, too. In fact, some of us blow them more than once, such as our fighter, who discovered a new fighting style. Fighting style in question is known as corpse tanking. Every single turn the goblins drop him to zeros and stabbed him while he's down to finish him off while he's at zeros, he needed to fail the death saving throw three times in order to actually die. Each successful attack on the goblins part automatically failed one saving throw. However, every round the paladin healed him with lay on hands for one hit point, bringing him back from the brink just so he can drop on the ground and become a pincushion again. The fact that no one died during this encounter was a goddamn miracle, especially since we were all so close. After the battle is over, we barely stop to loot the place. After grabbing and chewing on some of the goblin food, we rush back outside to take a long rest. Since there's no way we're fighting the Minotaur in our shape, obviously, about eight hours later, we return to the cave, only to find out that we're not the only guests here. The hags Grimlocks either dug too deep or assaulting the place on purpose through their tunnels. In any case, this fucking kitchen is now filled with new enemies, but not as much, so we kill them all pretty easily. This time we go slightly deeper into the room to find some kind of a cold storage where the goblins kept their food before slaughtering it. However, there's nothing inside except for a single huntsman. He's really, really happy to see us, especially since the goblins are going to eat him very soon. Oh, yeah, the huntsmen. We've heard about those. Aren't there supposed to be more? Oh, yes, there were more. But some were cooked a few days ago. Then there was a some huge battle yesterday, and the goblins were hungrier after it, so they ate the rest. Oh. 
We politely ask him what does he mean by yesterday? About eight hours ago. Oh, well, fuck. Okay, that sucked, but at least we saved one of them. It ain't that bad, right? We might want to reconsider our policy on eating strange food found on monster kitchens, though. After letting the huntsmen go, we head further into the caverns, fighting both grimlocks and goblins. Along the way until we find a strange, suspiciously empty tunnel filled with bones. This is the moment where I mention that the DM rolls for the wild magic surge every time the sorcerer casts a non-cantrip spell. I'm mentioning this right now for no reason at all. The walls are decorated with torches, a luxury otherwise absent from these caves since the goblins don't need the light. Yeah, this isn't fucking suspicious at all. Come on guys, even we aren't stupid enough to fall for that. This is where they keep the cube, the fighter deduces. How observant of you. You must be guarding treasures. No, 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 no. I'm gonna go find him and poke him with a torch. No, 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 no. After nearly engulfing himself into the cube by accident, since he can't actually see it until he gets too close, the fighter rips a torch from the wall and does exactly what he said. Well, if he hoped to intimidate the cube with this gesture, it didn't work. He made it angry instead. Some hotheads in the party wants to fight it. That is, until they look up his stats. We all turn and run as fast as we can, and the cube follows. Contrary to the popular myth, gelatinous cubes aren't actually slow. They simply have no reason to hurry. Now, normal human beings would run towards the exit from the caverns and take a long rest again, hoping that the cube will get bored and come back. Or, well, there will be actually somewhere to run to if we're out in the open. Instead, in our panic, we run further into the caverns. We run and don't look back, because we don't want to know how close that thing is. We don't look back and we don't look sideways too. We barely pay attention to the whole goblin war camp that we run past. Shot goblins try to throw some spears at us, but we don't give a single fuck about goblins. We need to run. And we run. Straight into a dead end. Fuck. Fuck. Fuck! This is the moment our DM calls for a smoking break and leaves. Meanwhile, we're frantically trying to come up with a plan. Well, not a plan, but at least something to advert our impending deaths. We even remember that we brought a few sacks of salt, for some reason, and we try to come up with some bullshit reasons why it will totally scare the cube off. When the DM returns, he begins describing the horrible screams we hear from the distance. Many, many horrible screams that grow louder by the second. Until they begin to quiet down. This thing just ate the whole war camp, didn't it? You know what that means. It isn't blocking our escape anymore, and we can return safely. We get all the way back and head down the torchlit tunnel that was previously guarded by the cube. At the end of it, there are two doors. One leading to the west, another to the east. Our paladin is feeling particularly gung-ho today, so she kicks the eastern door down with her hooves. Turns out, this door leads to the war camp, and the cube is waiting for us right behind it. We hastily kick the second door down, only to find that it leads to a bottomless pit. If we head to the left, we fall into the pit and die. If we don't, we'll have to fight the cube. Bottomless pit it is! When we land, it turns out that it wasn't that deep after all, or barely hurt. It's pretty dark in there, however, so we light torches to see where we actually ended up. This cavern may be filled with rubble and trash, but it's still a pretty huge place, big enough to house a second war camp, or a gigantic magic mirror, and a single minotaur. So it turns out, when Grimlock dug a tunnel, they intended to dig their way into the Minotaur's chambers and assassinate him. However, apparently they fucked it up and collapsed his lair instead. Now we're stuck with a gigantic pissed off Minotaur with the Warhammer the size of a grown man. After we finish shitting our pants, we roll full initiative and the sorcerer goes first. Finally is his time to shine. 
He lifts his hands up and chants the magic words of the catapult spell, Alahu Hawkbar. <laughs> Aloha Snack Bar. A single rock slowly begins levitating above the ground, and then, with a fushing noise, it smashes into the Minotaur's head, dealing respectable damage. Time to roll for Wild Magic Surge again, and it actually happens this time. Wonder what he's going to roll. Wild Magic Surge table is filled with LOL random trash. He rolls a 7. What does 7 stand for? It stands for Pick Related, a fireball spell centered on the sorcerer. Every single party member is in the fireball radius. We are all level 3. We begin to laugh nervously, because we're in danger, as the sorcerer rolls for damage. It's more than enough to kill us all, unless we make a dexterity save. Our laughter stops being nervous and becomes downright hysterical as we roll for dexterity. None of us, except for the sorcerer, makes it. Fucking lord. It gets worse. Okay, so this is the moment when I've realized that I really, really like this campaign and I want to continue. We can't just die in here, we barely started. And I know that Diem is also putting a lot of time and effort into writing this adventure. He actually did it the Wizard of the Coast way, writing down an entire design document. He put his soul into this thing. He's laughing right now, but there's no way he'll actually be okay with this kind of stupid ending. It takes some time and effort to stop laughing, but I snap out of it eventually. Hey, um, DM, you remember that we all have inspiration points from role-playing from all this? So? Well, you know how 5e is the Leave It Up to the DM edition? And remember how we played Star Wars Saga edition? There were destiny points there, very similar thing. They could be used for all kinds of things, like avoiding damage. Could we maybe use them to, you know, slightly lower the damage from the fireball? DM is overtaken by doubt, but other players begin supporting me, which happens rarely, and persuading him to listen. Finally, he agrees. Fine, you can have the damage from the fireball if you spend your inspiration, but only this once. And the sorcerer doesn't get to use it since it's his fault. Well, shit. Campaign saved. We are not dead after all, but we're simply nearly dead. And the Minotaur was not in the radius of the fireball at all. <laughs> Imagine being a Minotaur as you go to challenge this group of adventurers they fucking detonate in front of you. <laughs> Guess my job here is done. Hey guys, this is just a quick bit of promo. We got our website up and running and we have a massive restock on most of the models. However, one of the cool things about the website is if there's a model that you're waiting on, you can enter your email and be put on a waiting list. And it's not just good for you so then you'll know when they're restocked. We can also see what you guys are waiting on and what we should be printing. <laughs> so either way, the models are by far the best way to support this channel and to help us do videos that YouTube would find inappropriate on the platform. <laughs> Um, like, let's be serious. The models are pretty based looking, so once again, just look at the titties. Look at the lizard titties! <laughs> but anyway, let's continue on with the video. Okay, so the cast so far in this is Dietrich was the party's first fighter, a human battle master. Uh, he's a savant and a learned man, a professor from Reichland's University. He's the one who had the bright idea of poking the gelatinous cube with a torch. Aizen Riza was the second fighter, a human champion. He's a simple man of simple mind. He likes to get paid and doesn't like too much danger. He's the one who buddied up to the dog. Fiona the Bastard was the party's devotion paladin. She's a tiefling and essentially the Luke Skywalker slash Brienne of Tarth character, a wide-eyed young hero. Gunnar of the North was the party's hunter-ranger. A quiet man and the only party member with a lick of common sense. His player described him as androgynous, but nobody cared about what he described. Everyone imagined him like Aragorn, since Aragorn was what he played like. Belheimer was the party's wild sorcerer, a dwarf, while Faust was the open hand monk. I'm describing them together in a single line for a reason. Any of you seen The Search for the Bard Green Text? Those are the same players, different characters. 
So, there's Barsoom, the cursed guardian, the big guy in front of us. Formerly an elf, by the way. However, what really matters is he's a huge ass minotaur right now. If I could show you his stats right now, I would, but I can't. So just take my word for it. He was seriously overpowered for a low level boss. For example, he could action surge like a level 20 fighter. Naturally, since we've all barely escaped deaths, we all should take this new enemy seriously, given his ridiculous power. As you might understand by now, must and will are very different things for this party. Because Faust decides to spend his extremely valuable, limited time on a questionable action. He moves towards Bellheimer, lying on the ground and burning to death from his own fireball. He takes out his dick and extinguishes his comrade. So, actually fighting the monster is up to Dietrich, Eisen, Fiona, and Gunner. Luckily, they're all well rested despite being heavily wounded. They all have their abilities on their hands. Gunnar goes first thanks to his high initiative. He casts the hunter's mark on the Minotaur and manages to shoot him. The Minotaur goes next. He action surges and nearly murders Eisen on the spot. It becomes clear that Barsum must die during this round, or the avoided TPK will be repeated again. Dietrich slashes the beast with his greatsword. As for Eisen, at this point he'll keep fighting well after his death. He simply won't notice actually dying. Minotaur falls when Fiona smites. Thanks to the crit multiplying the smite damage, and the monster is finished. Once again, proving that it doesn't matter how big and strong you are. If you're alone, action economy is not on your side. Fine. Now what? Just to clarify, when Gwyn, the witch of the Spiderwoods, told us that she needs a magical mirror, we thought it would be a small mirror on the wall, like the one from Snow White. We did not expect a 16 foot tall monstrosity in a golden frame encrusted with gems. We still need to bring it to the witch, somehow. Which will probably involve taking it up the pit, though the tiny goblin tunnels in all the way through the woods. Dietrich has a genius idea, fitting his education and background. If we pry the mirror from its frame, it will be a lot smaller. Eisen has another genius idea. If we pry the gems out of the frame too, we'll be a lot richer. Attempted vandalism ensues, and every time we touch the mirror, it begins briefly showing something horrible. And then someone horrible. I would call him devious, in fact. He begins hissing something very insulting at us, and Fiona seems to understand him, confirming our suspicions. The devil begs us to stop acting like chimps and breaking the priceless artifact. It's nearly the last of its kind, and destroying such a work of art would be pretty horrible even for the man. He even gives us helpful advice. We shouldn't try to bring the mirror the Gwen, just bring her to the mirror instead. He also notes our destructive potential and offers us a deal. There's an elf of ancient bloodline that wronged him in the past. The devil really, really wants him dead, and he's willing to make one of us a warlock if we agree to it. The only person interested in such a power is Dietrich, and even then, briefly. The rest of the group decides that making deals with the devil is a bad idea. The player might or might not have had experience with this in the previous campaign. The session ends and some important stuff happens off session. Namely, Faust's player gets called names for a role playing a thug instead of a monk. Also, this is the moment where the sorcerer's player disappears. When our next session starts, Faust's player announces how when the party wakes up, their monk is nowhere to be found. His staff is left behind and that's all that's left from him. The DM says, no, fuck that noise. Since you're switching characters for no good reason, you're rolling this whole thing through. Oh, he's switching characters. Yes, that might be for the best. First, he rolls for stealth in order to not wake the party up when he's leaving. He fails spectacularly and wakes up the entire party instead. 
We gather around him and begin asking him questions he really doesn't want to answer, such as, where are you going? Why are you leaving? How exactly are you going to survive by yourself? Those are all the questions he really doesn't want to answer, but in the end, he does mumble something about, I know you're in the right hands and you will survive here. And so he climbs out of the pit and leaves, silent and graceful. Just kidding. The DM makes him roll for athletics for every 10 feet of the pit in order to not fall down. He falls down around 6 times, nearly killing himself, until he actually makes it out successfully. And this is the end of the tale of Faust the Renegade. Just kidding. The DM makes him roll for survival too. Remember how I've told you that we never used the hiding and rotating map feature because we had the ranger with us? Well, when I was saying that, I didn't think that I'll be telling the story this far. Faust wanders the woods for about 10 hours, lost, confused, and hungry, until he bumps into Gwen's hut, where he finds the rest of the party comfortably sleeping outside. He joins them, naturally. When the party wakes up, they're surprised to see Faust's mug again. Even Gwen is amused by the situation. Once again, he says goodbyes and hastily leaves. Cue to even more failed survival checks. On his way out of the forest, Faust the Renegade is eaten by wolves. Back to the cave. The party decides to loot everything before leaving, and we're really saddened by the fact that we can't steal Barsom's hammer. In our search for riches, we find some sort of diary. I read that as dairy for a second. <laughs> a Minotaur's dairy? Some sort of diary that the Minotaur has written back when he was an elf. It talks a lot about some mysterious threat. It name drops the priestess called Miralith several times, and most importantly, it talks about the Covenant. It doesn't actually say what the Covenant does, but it seems that it's a spell of some kind. In this dairy, and this diary contains the third known to Barsom. Okay, that doesn't sound important at all, and it probably won't matter in the long run. We're here for the Golden Cup, remember? We are hired by a merchant to retrieve it. So, after we abandon our insane plans to take the mirror to the surface, we climb up the pit. Just kidding. The DM decides that now is the time to teach us the importance of skills and class features. So we also have to make athletic checks every 10 feet to climb up. Since none of us actually has athletics leveled, we fall down again and again, nearly dying in the process. Eventually, Aizen does successfully get up and throw down a rope. The DM sounds really smug. That's what we get for mocking Thief's class features. Climbing is useful. Sure, sure it is. Once per the campaign, during a very special episode, we can get out of the cave without any troubles. We don't even meet the cube on the way out, surprisingly. We get to Gwen's hut without any trouble. Tell her that Barsom is dead and the path to the mirror is free. Afterwards, we take a long rest. For the night is dark and full of terrors. In the morning, we see our old friend Faust. Not for long, though, since he's hasty to leave again. The witch is back, too. She's slightly displeased with the fact that we forgot to mention a roaming homicidal cube, but is quick to forgive us. We are like your retarded cousin. You know it's not his fault. He can't. Good news. During the night, Gwen took a stroll to Barsom's lair and divined the cup's location. Bad news. The cup is in the very heart of the forest, beneath the roots of the Felucian tree. In the very heart of the corrupted woods, where the hag Myrtle and her minions reside. Horrible news. Gwen's not alone. She brought a friend from somewhere. He's a dwarf. He's our new PC, and he's Jar Jar Binks' level of annoying. Each and every member of the party does his best to ignore the dwarf's existence from here on. Now, here's what we know. Barsom is dead, his lair looted. Myrtle has the thing we want, but the road to her lies through the marshes infested with angry elven ghosts. But the necromancer, he doesn't seem to be tied to the plot in any way at all. Perfectionists easily outvote the pragmatists, solely represented by Aizen, and we decide that our souls simply won't rest if we don't kill the Necromancer before doing what we've been actually hired for. 
But before that, we head to the Huntsman Lodge to visit that one guy who we didn't need, Audric. At least someone is happy to see us for a change. He wants to reward us for having saved his life with some jewelry he hid in the hollow tree, but we need his help to find it. We take our first NPC companion with us all the way to the place. Along the way we have two encounters. First we fight a couple ogres. Since we had a surprise round we easily killed them both. However as for the second one, it's spiders. About time we meet some since the place is called Spider Woods. Look at those guys in Monster Manual right now. Those are some beasts, especially in large numbers we met them in. They tear through our defenses easily, and their poison damage is downright brutal. The fact that none of us died is a testament solely to our tactical genius. Wounded, we have to seek shelter, and the nearby cave becomes our haven. While we rest, we can't shake off the feeling of being watched. This is a moment of respite, where our heroes are in relative safety, so they can afford to talk and find out more about each other. Dietrich was a learned man, well into his 40s, respected by his colleagues Bax and Drexenford and admired by many, yet he was not satisfied with his life anymore. He desired excitement, danger, a real man's life. He doesn't care for being an old professor taking exams from brain dead students anymore. He's here to live by the sword on a life of adventure, the one that he always secretly yearned for. When he reclaims the relic, he'll finally prove to himself that he's not living his life in vain. Aizen desired to live by the sword too. He was a common soldier for years before becoming a mercenary he is now. The only reason he's seeking to reclaim the relic is to make a name for himself as a fighter and a mercenary. Maybe then he can join such legendary warriors as the Panzer Richters and live the good life as a knight. Never without food on his plate, a coin in his pocket, or a good fight before him again. Fiona also desired knighthood, but for a different reason. As a child, she was left by unknown parents to be raised in the Greentown Monastery, the home of the Knights of St. Fergus. Her entire life, she was surrounded by many young men trained to become holy warriors, yet despite all her religious fervor and righteous life, she could not become a knight herself. By reclaiming a holy relic, she could show the knights that she's just as righteous as they are and take her rightful place amongst her brothers. Gunnar did not have his brothers with him anymore. He lost them all back in the Forgotten North when he was not strong enough, not cunning enough to save them all. And now he found them, those brave fools, heading to their deaths without a care in the world like his comrades once did. He could not watch it happen again, making sure they survive and reclaim the relic was his duty. Oh, yeah, there was the dwarf too, but we're still trying to ignore his existence as much as we can. We coined a name for him, however, the Old Fart. Our sorcerer is also still technically alive, but heavily burnt and totally catatonic after being caught in the middle of that explosion. And we still have our loyal huntsman, Audric, who probably really hates himself for agreeing to come with us now. So, the only exit leads back to the spider woods. The woods infested with deadly poisonous spiders who can hear crawl outside. We really don't want to use it because we still haven't morally recovered from our last fight with them, but what choice do we have, really? Well, we could use the gigantic door carved in the stone wall of the cave. Well, we couldn't since there seems to be no obvious way to open it. The solution comes to us soon, when the light of the moon touches the walls of the cavern, a magical writing appears which says something along the lines of, The gates of the tomb will only open themselves to the song of the dawn. I can just almost hear Tolkien doing cartwheels in his grave. Song of the dawn, that sounds familiar. Didn't we read something like this in the Minotaur's diary? Yes we have. But it's something else entirely from the Covenant, so we don't actually know what that thing does. But the Song of the Dawn is written down there. So our most charismatic party members could theoretically sing it. Fiona and Dietrich have a minor squabble about which one of them sings better. 
until they decide that they can sing the song of the dawn in duet just fine. Both rolled pretty respectable performance, but that's the moment when the DM says that he wants them to sing out loud. To say that it was a nightmarish experience is to say nothing at all. Neither of them had either the voice for singing or the hearing for it, so by the end of it, the DM was begging them to stop. It seems the gates could not bear it either, since they slowly opened, inviting the heroes inside. The place we ended up in turned out to be none other than a tomb of a great elven hero. Mighty was his sword arm and blessed was his blade. Yeah, yeah, whatever. None of us care about the knife ears that much. Old Fart continues cracking stupid jokes, but we don't really listen to him. Occasionally, Dietrich snaps back at him with a retort, but that's it. Suddenly, our feeling of being followed gets some closure. A tall, armored man suddenly comes from behind the corner. In one hand, he holds a warhammer. In the other, the holy symbol of the Sovereign, the one human god. He calls himself Sir Gregor, a knight from the Kingdom of Dulast. Fiona immediately asks him if he's looking for the relic too but he just shakes his head. He doesn't know anything about the relic and he can't reveal his mission, but it's of extreme importance. Old Fart makes a mistake of insulting the elves again and an arrow pierces the air, landing slightly below his feet. His attacker is Talendil, an elven woman and Gregor's companion, as he explains it. She does not take insults to her people well, so the dwarf should be watching his tongue. Before Old Fart manages a retort, Fiona warns him that neither she nor anyone really is going to protect him if he will continue picking fights. Nobody protests and Old Fart momentarily shuts up for the time being. Turns out both groups want to reach Felucian, so they unite. I keep wanting to say Felucia. <laughs> the, both groups want to reach Felucia. <laughs> Damn it, sorry. The tomb is surprisingly short and ends with a dead end. There's only a well filled with water there. Telendil reveals as a gate to the deeper level of the tomb. It's dormant now, but it can be awakened with blood magic. Fiona volunteers to give her blood again, but this time she actually has to follow through. The gate answers to her sacrifice, and elven magic takes us away. All of us except for Talendil appear in a tiny room with no exits. The ceiling creaks as it begins descending on our heads. Panicked, quivering, screaming, we look around, trying to figure out the way to escape this death trap. It must be a trap, right? Everything becomes clear when Gunnar finally looks down on the floor. Unlike the stone walls around, the blood-stained floor is metallic. It also has small holes in it. Their purpose is probably to let the blood flow down. This is not a trap. It's a sacrificial chamber. Gunnar yells at his discovery, and all as one we start smashing the floor with our weapons and stomping, trying to displace the metal plates. Elves probably didn't design it to endure so many armed and armored people, and we succeed. The floor crashes down and we fall down with it. After managing to not drown in the pool of blood, we climb out and look around. Who knows, maybe we're trapped again. No, this is indeed the second level of the tomb. We're surrounded by statues of the elven gods, the mother, the father, all of them false idols now. After recovering and catching our breath, we head deeper and soon meet with Talendil. She's alive and well, naturally. She claims that she had no idea that the gate took elves and non-elves to different places, though she probably could have seen it coming. We pretend to believe her. The air becomes colder as we venture deeper and deeper. Soon the interior of the tomb changes. As we enter the final chamber, the air is filled with mist. Millions of white threads cover the floor like a carpet, like a web. And then we hear him, the necromancer. Driven insane by isolation aeons ago, he's ranting at us, seeing faces of his enemies in the intruders. We shiver as he steps out of the shadows and shows himself. A colossal ancient drider with white hair so long it falls down the floor and covers it, 
filling the entire chamber. It's moving. It's twisting. It's grabbing us by our ankles and reaching for our necks. The necromancer is downright brutal. On every turn we rolled saving throws against being grappled by his hair. If we failed, we were damaged and unable to move. Given the fact that over half of our party fought in melee, it was downright crippling. He might have never moved, but we still couldn't approach him. Fiona was the only one who had backup weapons, her javelins, but could not be used for smites, and they ran out fast. Gunnar and Audric, however, carried their weight, being the best ranged damage dealers. While they were still damaged by the Necromancer's legendary actions, they weren't affected that badly by being unable to move. That is, until the Drider decided that playtime is over. He called forth the Shays from their resting places and commanded them to attack us. And this was the moment when we realized how fucked are we. In Monster Manual, Shades have less than one CR, but they are absurdly dangerous. Not only do they resist all non-magical damage, but each of their successful attacks reduces your strength. When your strength reaches zero, it's all over for you. Naturally, the part of our party that did not spend their youth in the gym started sweating. Audric was killed, may his soul find rest, and very soon we realize that unless a miracle happens, we will follow him really soon. And this is the moment when the party should have died. However, a rules mistake was made, and Gregor casted the Prayer of Healing, the spell that should have taken 10 minutes of casting time in a single action. Meanwhile, Fiona managed to reach the largest group of shades and turned undead. With his enemies funfairly restored to their full fighting capability and his servants turned, Necromancer started losing ground really, really quickly. When Aizen made the jump over him and landed right behind his back, flinking him with Dietrich, it was all decided. While part of the party mourns that poor Audric, who never asked to be a part of this shit, the rest starts looting the tomb of the great elven hero for his great elven treasures. The most obvious treasure of all of them was his plus one greatsword. It's untouched by rust after all those years, its blade is white like milk. Naturally, Dietrich, the only man who uses two-handed weapons in his party, and also the closest thing this group has to a leader, claims it for himself. The second object in the possession of the Necromancer is a human eye. It's still moving and glaring at us. It's obviously magical, but we do not understand a thing beyond that, so we just take it with us. And finally, the Necromancer, much like Barsum, had a diary in his possession. It's found by Talendil. Momentarily, she opens it, turns pages as if knowing what to look for, and tears out the last few. When questioned about it, she answers that those secrets belong only to the elves, and man is not meant to hold them. Dietrich takes a guess. Maybe it's related to the Covenant? When he speaks the word, Talendil's face changes, and it continues changing when we mention that we already have a third of it. She shows us some extremely expensive gems and offers us them all, if we simply hand over the Covenant to her. But she also resists probing for information. Dietrich is having none of it. If she wants to hoard the Covenant for herself and refuses to tell its purposes, she's not getting our part. To cement his claims, he tears Barsom's diary apart. Now neither party has a way of learning the part of the Covenant belonging to the other, unless they talk it out. While traveling to the surface, Dietrich does try to talk it out. And by that, I mean he's trying to make a move on Talandil. Repeatedly. Midlife crises, you'll fuck us all. Both parties seem to agree on one thing. We need each other, and whatever differences and issues might have right now really don't matter. We can work them all out after we reach Felution, but after that we have to work together if we want to survive. So Talendil doesn't even seem to mind our rude gesture with the Covenant that much. It helps that she's so racist that she expected such a thing from humans. She even shares the Necromancer's diary with us, the part that doesn't hold the Covenant, anyway. 
Turns out, it doesn't belong to him, but to some half-elf who infiltrated the elven society. He speak about elven savagery, about the great evil that will soon fuck them all, and again the name of the priestess Merilith is dropped. The writer seems to think she's fucking creepy. Dietrich, meanwhile, is acting really strangely ever since he dealt the final blow to the necromancer. Not only he's having bad, not only is he having bad dreams, he also seemed to learn magic overnight. Magic that really came in handy for us, so he did not ask questions. It was his business. Tylendil leads us out of the tomb and takes us through the hidden elven path to the ruins of an elven city. This is Myrtle's territory and probably the most dangerous part of the spider woods except for the marshes, so naturally we behave really, really carefully and listen to every word that Tolendil says. Just kidding. We get too close to a lake and wake a colossal magic octopus that immediately tries to kill us all. Nice uh, Moria callback there, pal. Once again, we're forced into the dungeon just because it's the handiest escape route, Moria, but this time it was our actual destination. Those tunnels lead inside the city, which means to Felution. Well, we don't actually have time to ponder that. We were too busy running at the top of our speed since the monster's nimble tentacles were trying to winkle us out of the tunnels. We only stopped running when we entered a very very strange place. Hey guys, this is just a quick bit of promo. We got our website up and running and we have a massive restock on most of the models. However, one of the cool things about the website is if there's a model that you're waiting on, you can enter your email and be put on a waiting list. And it's not just good for you so then you'll know when they're restocked. We can also see what you guys are waiting on and what we should be printing. <laughs> so either way, the models are by far the best way to support this channel. And to help us do videos that YouTube would find inappropriate on the platform. <laughs> and, like, let's be serious, the models are pretty based looking, so... Once again, just look at the titties. Look at the lizard titties! <laughs> but anyway, let's continue on with the video. It was a cavern. A gigantic hall filled with hundreds of cheering monsters. Kobolds, Grimlocks, Lizardmen, all kinds of scum and villainy gathered in one place, feasting and drinking. At least, that's what it looked like upon the first sight, but when we actually paid more attention to it, the place suddenly began seeming more familiar and bizarre at the same time, especially to Fiona. In the middle of the cavern, there was a colossal round pit, filled with bones and stained with blood. It was surrounded by uncountable numbers of benches and badly made chairs, upon which monsters were sitting, holding sticks with colored rags attached to them. They cheered loudly for whatever happenings entertained them. There was a gigantic wooden stand in the distant counter, corner, counter, behind which stood a troll with a crossbow. Near him, there were about 20 wooden barrels filled with all kinds of brews. There was even a merchant with his own carriage full of wares. And to top it off, there was one goblin unlike the others, sitting on a quite well-made throne, obviously stolen from the ruins, and he wore a wooden crown. To the left side of him stood a giant toad, and to the right was his herald, a loud-mouthed goblin who was just announcing the unexpected guests, meaning us. They were playing humans. They were all trying to simulate human life as they understood it, with made-up titles and banners in their own tournament, and we were honored foreign knights. The Herald introduces the Goblin Chief as Cocker King, King of the Big Cockers. He also informs us that we're just in time for the tourney. We are invited to sit down, eat, drink, and most importantly, take part. This is not a request. As the Herald reads the long list of the participants and all of their titles, the party is offered all kinds of foul-smelling food and, most importantly, drinks. While Gunnar is visibly strained, the explanation is obvious. He hates greenskins with a passion, so he's barely restraining himself from trying to kill them all right now. But Fiona, meanwhile, is having a great time. She's really entertained by how monsters try to imitate humans, and hey, they recognize her as a knight. Everybody else is acting pretty chill. Old Fart even eats what he recognizes as human meat, and eyes and tries their brew. But Dietrich, Dietrich is gonna have none of it. He stands up and steps forward, pointing his finger at the Cocker King himself. They have no time for this, he says. 
Let's settle this right now. You and me, single combat. The entire group puts on forced smiles as they look on their insane companion with obvious worry. The Cocker King doesn't even think for a second. He merely agrees to Dietrich's challenge, hops on his toad mount and rides forward to the arena. He intends to fight with a wooden crutch. Dietrich, being the learned man he is, recognizes the obvious danger of the giant toad and the obvious advantage of the reach weapons. So he switches to his glaive instead of his magic sword. Both Fiona and Sir Gregor realize that Dietrich is taking a huge gamble right now, so he must win. They pray to the higher power and bestow him with buffs while nobody is looking. As the monster crowd cheers, the party laughs nervously as the fight begins. Cheaters. First of all, Dietrich probably should have asked for a mount, even if he probably wouldn't have got one. Giant Toad is a dangerous foe for a single human to fight, but Dietrich manages to keep it at range and use his Battlemaster maneuvers in a clever manner. For some time, it almost seems like that he's going to make it. The damn beast is half dead and King Cocker is clearly looking worried. But no, he's devoured alive instead. The crowd cheers for the dead hero, while the party looks at the arena in shock and in disbelief, unsure of what to do. But Eisen knows exactly what to do. Unsheathing both of his swords, he yells, Two against one isn't fair! and jumps to the arena. The crowd stops cheering and starts orgasming. They're throwing weapons and barrels at the ring as Eisen finishes the toad off. Before this, King Cocker was clearly enjoying this, but the moment his pet monster dies, his face instantly becomes grim. He throws away his crutch and takes out a spiked club drenched in manticore poison. In one hit, he almost kills Eisen where he stands, but for the rest of the battle, things aren't going in his favor. The poison was a one-time thing, while Eisen's weapons are overall superior. When the Goblin King drops dead on the ground, the crowd goes berserk. And I do not mean that cheering for the winner. No, they actually go berserk. The monsters pull out their weapons. The troll bartender arms, arms aims his gigantic crossbow. The shamans begin chanting their spells. Apparently, people don't like it when you kill their kings. The group gets on their feet and stand back to back, looking at the countless screaming enemies around, all thirsting for their blood. At this moment, my memory of the session turns into the red haze. There are no words that can do this fight justice. It was pure fucking carnage. Even if half of the monsters ran when the Cocker King fell, the remaining half was the largest and most brutal encounter I've ever seen in my life. Those weren't one-hit point wonders like 4E minions. Those were full-blown monsters just like they were described in Monster Manual. It was pure carnage. Monsters were dying left, right, and center, and heroes fell on the ground and bled out, only to be raised from the zeros and thrown into the fight again. The troll's crossbow was fired and reloaded and fired again, and every time he fired it, a die was rolled to see in which direction this monstrosity will misfire. His arrows, no, his projectile spears were as lethal as cannonballs as they tore through combatants both us and his allies. Sir Gregor did not allow anybody to outdo his kill count. His maximized thunder wave almost killed Dietrich, who was just cut out from the dead toad's belly, but it also pulverized countless greenskins. Goblin bodies form hills on which we stood our ground and butchered them all. Lizard shamans were raining fire and blood upon us and their own, blinded by the bloodlust. Aizen and Dietrich cleaved through their ranks one by one, while Talendil and Gunnar were running the troll with arrows. Fiona, screaming in battle fervor, blindly charged into an ogre, her flail burning with holy fire. Sir Gregor's hammer was a thunder made iron, cracking skulls, while his holy symbol shined with light, bringing those close to dying back from the brink to fight again. 
Even old fart was doing something useful, engaging in a duel with enemy spellcasters and spraying them with poison. When the ranks of Big Cocker started growing thin, we thought that might be the end, but it was only the beginning. The slave masher rushed to his masher. The slave master rushed to the cages and let their best gladiators loose. The ogre called Tusk was the supreme fighter, while the knoll hide was able to disappear into thin air without a single trace. We barely had anything left in us as it was, and some of the cockers still lived. Even the troll bartender with his crossbow was still an ever-present threat. We could not hold out much longer. Our spells came to an end. Eisen was corpse tanking yet again, while Dietrich carried surprisingly hard for someone who was barely alive a few minutes ago. Fiona was smashed into the ground by an ogre, still alive but rapidly dying, while Tallendil was utterly outmatched by Hyde. That's when Dietrich had the brightest idea he's ever had in his entire life as a professor. He breathed in, and with all the strength that was left in his lungs, he began shouting, The king is dead. Now the largest must become the king of the big cockers. And he rolled for bluff. In literally any other situation, it would not work. We would fail. We would all die right there and right now. But our most lethal enemies were an ogre and a troll. There was a pause, and then they charged right into each other. The troll was a resilient enemy, able to regenerate any wound, but Tusk could not give less fucks about what the bartender could or could not regenerate. He tore his enemy apart limb by limb again and again, and each time the troll would regenerate, he would scream and tear him into pieces again. This gave us much needed time to gather our strength and turn it on Hyde, decimating him in a single round. Then Tallendil jumped into the fight between the big boys with a torch. His regeneration was halted and he promptly died. Killing the lone, heavily wounded ogre proved easy. When we were finished, we looked upon the battlefield and saw nothing but an endless field of corpses. And we stood on it. As winners. First of all, Diem declared that the session is over for today, since the entire scene went off the rails the moment Dietrich called for a duel with the king, which was something he did not predict. Even though he really should have, since he knew that player for years. But we were supposed to take part in the tourney. He even showed us some really impressive notes detailing every little thing we could do there and custom mechanics for crowd's level of love towards the fighters. Since this gigantic battle was not something he predicted, he didn't really count CR2, so he is going to do it right now. After he finished, he said this, You know how certain thresholds were supposed to be deadly for you? Well, it was seven times that, and all of us survived. This is a... Um, fuck. Old Fart survived. After giving us enough XP to level up right there, the DM left to prepare for the next session, since the plot took a very different turn now. He left, and we immediately started discussing how fucking cool this whole fight was. Even though looking at his notes, doing the thing as planned would have probably be more fun, though significantly less metal, we defeated the encounter seven times deadly. We are the champions. We are invincible and undefeatable. We're full of pride, and pride goeth before the fall. We left the first level of the dungeon and proceeded to the second after taking a full rest. A few sessions full of little things followed, nothing I'm going to describe in depth at least. First, an entire session was wasted on old fart, while chipping into a crocodile, swimming back and forth between a lizardman merchant and the party, trying to haggle for a magic item. Then it was the time when we left the dungeon for some clear air for a few seconds, only to realize that we ended up in the marshes. We fought quite a few orc zombies and Aizen got a magical axe for himself. Then there was this time when the party found royal living quarters, including a luxurious bathroom. Fiona was the only one to use the opportunity to clean herself, while the rest of the party decided to go further without her and ended up fighting ghouls. When she heard the sounds of battle, she jumped out of the bath and rushed to help her friends just like that. Fan service ensued. 
There was a fight with several mimics who infested the living quarters. That was nothing special, though. Then we found a lab belonging to local elven Dr. Mengele, who performed horrible experiments with humans, trying to make them immortal like elves. Since the doctor was thousands of years dead, we just burned his research notes, smashed his lab, and that was the best we could do. There was also this time when we fought a shitload of rust monsters with sticks because we were too afraid to damage our equipment. And this one time when we found the mage quarters and found the last will of the city's archmage. That one allowed us to take everything we wanted from him, but pleaded us to leave his ornate mystery box with him. The DM actually gave us XP for playing against our type, not being autistic murder hobos and not robbing the dead wizard. It was all pretty great in the hindsight. Frankly, we all grew very close together as a team. Nobody had much love for old Fart still, but at a certain point he stopped being that annoying. He just kind of grew on us. Gunnar nearly killed Fiona in the very beginning when he saw her face. Now he treated her like a little sister in need of guidance. Dietrich looked down on the others, but now everyone looked up to him as a brave and powerful leader. Even Tallendil transcended being a racist asshole slyly and became a lovable asshole instead. But you know what never changed? Our constant need to explore and shove our noses where they don't belong. It happened in a tiny, narrow branch of the caverns, an utter dead end on the second level. It held something of interest, a human skeleton in a full looking sack. Alarm bells started going off in Gunnar's head as he tried to warn his companions not to approach it. But it was too late. It moved like lightning. A long tentacle came out of nowhere and grabbed Tallendil by the ankle. The elf didn't even have the time to scream. She was pulled into the darkness in the blink of an eye, and her head disappeared in the monstrous maw. And just like that, she died. We stared at the roper with wide open eyes. Then we began screaming. We ran. We ran without looking back. When we stopped to catch our breath, we just looked at each other, unable to comprehend what just happened. She just... died. She survived through so much with us, she couldn't just die in a second. We wanted to go back and make sure if she's dead, but we were too terrified of dying too. But Old Fart has an idea. He grabs a potion of invisibility he found earlier and takes a sip. Before we could stop him, he disappeared without a trace. The dwarf came back. He saw Tallendil's headless body lying lifeless on the stone. Her hands clenched her bow, and her bag was still hanging on her shoulders. The bag. He knew little of the Covenant, just like us, but he knew it was important. He knew it's got something to do with ancient darkness imprisoned here, and he knew that we only possess one third of it. The second part was in her bag. So, he took the risk. He could not see the Roper anymore, but he was sure he was still there. But maybe if he walks very, very silently, he can approach her body, reach for her bag, and quickly rush back. But when the monster saw the elf's body move, it knew exactly what was going on. He launched every one of his tentacles forward, and one of them managed to grab the dwarf's arm. The next thing we heard were his screams. We could not just stand there, even if we knew what was going to happen to us. We rushed back, weapons in our hands, ready to fight this time. He might have been an annoying prick, but he was one of us, and we could not abandon him to die. Not without at least trying to save him. When we reached the Roper, the dwarf was still alive. He was quiet as if accepting his fate, as the tentacles were choking him. Fiona charged forward without thinking, flail in her hands. She struck the monster again and again, but the beast's hide was as strong as steel. None of us could as much as touch him reliably. And worse than that, the tunnel in which the Roper was hiding was so narrow only one of us could be fighting it in melee at once and flanking him was absolutely impossible. 
Gunnar did not risk shooting. He could hit Fiona and kill her if he wasn't careful enough. Fighting the Roper at all was pure tactical suicide. When the dwarf died and the tentacles grabbed our paladin, it seemed like a foregone conclusion. We should be running while we still have the chance. But running was not an option. Sir Gregor lifted his hammer up and began chanting a prayer to the Sovereign. And out of nowhere, a gust of wind appeared, blowing the heroes away from the beast. Even Fiona was pulled from the Roper's grasp. The Roper hissed, robbed of his prey, but he could do little. When we ran as fast as we could, abandoning the bodies of our comrades and leaving the Covenant behind. Our next long rest was spent in mourning and despair. We blamed our greed for the losses that we suffered. Nor could we forget the loss of the Covenant. Only Talendil knew its true purpose beyond keeping the dark at bay, and she was gone, along with her piece of the spell. Occasionally, Fiona tried to mumble something about how we could still retrieve it, how we could still make it but she was shut down every time. We've already had enough of playing heroes. We continue traveling through the ruined city, but our morale is all times low. We just lost two of our comrades, even the ones we didn't really love in the matter of seconds. If only we had some source of comic relief to lighten up the mood. Oh, right, he's dead. Soon we reached the new stop, the Orc Tribe. Just like the big cockers, they didn't attack us on sight. Probably because they knew exactly who we are, turns out. Those few who managed to not only see us in action, but also run from our wrath were very talkative. They would probably tell very different tales if they saw us fight that roper. Apparently, the chief of the tribe doesn't want to fight us, he wants to see us. As we travel through the tribe's territory, however, we see a slave auction. A half-orc, a human woman, and a half are being sold by the slave master. This is what our DM calls the lawful good tax. Fiona just can't walk past this. However, every time she makes a bid, one of the few suspiciously rich orcs manages to one-up her price. It keeps going and going until she runs out of her money. And this is the moment when Sir Gregor sighs and hands her the gems. The very same gems that Talandiel offered for the Peace of the Covenant. The bidding goes on, but she's still one-upped every time. Soon she doesn't have enough money again. This is the moment when Aizen sighs and hands her even more money to bid with. Finally, the slave owners seem to run out of coin. The slaves are handed to the girl and they shower her with thanks which distracts us and makes us feel good just for long enough to realize that we've been duped. All this time, Fiona's been bidding against the same orcs, the very same orcs that suspiciously disappeared along with the slave master with all of our money. Damn it, we were played for fools. But at least we saved some lives from slavery, right? Right. Why doesn't it feel as good as it should? After we finish crying over our lost money, we head to the tribal chief. Wonder what does he want to discuss with us? Are we doing the gladiator thing again? However, when we finally meet him, a lot of things become clear instantly, at least to one of us. The chief of the tribe is not actually an orc, just a half-orc, and Dietrich knows him very well. Apparently, he says apparently a lot. Back when he was a slave, his masters decided that they wanted him educated, so they sent him to Drexenfurt to study. Who could be this professor who passed him through his last exams? After the chief stops triggering me with his modern speak in my low fantasy setting, he asks us what brought us to this place. Well, we're here to reach a solution to find a golden relic, actually. Fighting Myrtle's people and finding the Covenant's pieces are actually our side goals. The chief is perfectly willing to help us, for old time's sake, of course, if we help ourselves first. Turns out there's a second tribe of orcs nearby, the ones who serves Myrtle. They've been a real pain in the ass, especially since they kidnapped some of his people. Also, some of our people too, all the way from Greentown. Also, they're summoning demons and preparing to assault this place. So the chief's solution is simple. We help them attack first and crush Myrtle's tribe. 
This should benefit both of us. No. Maybe he could even help us find the covenant we seek. Afterwards, of course. In return, he gives us a two-handed hammer, the Spellbreaker. I don't use two-handed weapons. Neither do I. Let Gregor have it? Sure, why not? Gunner seems really conflicted about this idea. On one hand, we're helping an orc tribe. On the other hand, we're about the genocide of an orc tribe. However, the news about the human hostages sway our choice. We really should at least try to save them from Myrtle. So we offer the chief our full support and begin preparations for the battle. Have you ever heard the saying, war is hell? It's not true at all. You see, hell is simply fire and brimstone. Sure, it really sucks, but you know what to expect, right? War is much, much worse than hell. Beyond every corner, we're met with the same thing. A squad of orc archers, every single one ready to action to shoot the very first person to show up. As we continue storming the tribe's cave, our frontline fighters begin to resemble people less and less, instead evolving into pin cushions. Sure, the archers are easy to kill, but they are so numerous and our allied tribe absolutely refuses to go first, instead of allowing us to take the hits. You're next in line for the genocide. Expect us, scum. By the time we actually meet the demon they've been summoning, it's a fucking relief. At least he can't exploit readied actions. This hyped up hellish creature turns out to be an utter cakewalk after all those archers. Fiona just kept him on the ground with the shield bash. Gunnar provided most of the damage and he never really got to harm us significantly at all. We return to the chief victorious very soon. But instead of feeling satisfied from genociding greenskins and saving humans, we're feeling pretty frustrated about this other tribe. Hey, you know, what has Myrtle even done to us? We haven't even talked. She may be evil, but maybe she's not a bitch. Who knows? As we report to the chief, we're all strongly considering turning on him and genociding the second tribe too. Even Fiona. Especially Fiona. Dietrich even thought of a great one-liner. This time you pass, into the better world. Sadly, his tribe is too big. We're all feeling exhausted, so we wuss out. But one day we'll come back. Oh, and we still want your help with the Covenant. So it turns out that the Chief doesn't actually know much about the Covenant at all, but he does know how to reach Felution. We simply have to get through the third undead infested level of the city. The one that none of the orcs ever survived. For some reason, he's sure that we'll find whatever we're looking for there. Yes, Chief, we'll definitely be visiting you again. But we have little choice. We've got too far, and there's no sense in giving up now. Hey, remember how all of this started in an inn? And how each of us was promised payment of 100 gold pieces per person for retrieving this cup? We're really tempted to piss in it and leave it under a tree at this point. The third level is called the Gauntlet because it's a series of trials intended for an elven priestess. So we'll have to simply do what any elven cleric could do. Sounds pretty simple, right? The first trial involves a simple puzzle. There's a room filled with moving orbs of light. You must pass through the room without touching them. Seems easy enough. Except the moment we step into the room, the orbs stop moving in predictable patterns and start changing them, or sometimes flying straight towards us for no good reason. Oh, and the catch is, if the orb touches you, it disappears. Also, summons shades and wraiths. Luckily, this time some of us actually have magical weapons. Two of us can turn undead. But it still triggers our worst memories about our encounter with a necromancer. When we finish this bullshit, we're more pissed than ever. Also drained. Literally. In fact, we don't actually finish it in the normal sense. We escape from the race through the portal the moment our second trial becomes available, since we can't stop getting hit by orbs every goddamn round. The good news is, the second trial is entirely different than the first one. No wraiths involved. Unlike the huge chamber of the first trial, the second chamber is tiny, just enough to hold us. It also doesn't have an exit, only three walls and a wall-sized mirror. The floor is made of stone this time, and it's also covered with dead bodies. What is it with elven gates leading us to death traps? We try our proven solution again with attempting to break through the mirror, but this time it doesn't work. 
Even when we try the spell breaker, it doesn't seem to scratch the mirror at all. The fact that an easy, violent solution don't seem to work takes us outside of our comfort zone and makes us sit through some self-reflection. Gunnar is the first to look into the mirror attentively and feel it tempt him with promises. He sees himself far, far away in the old north, and there's smoke of human settlements behind his back. He's got a bow in his hands. The one that no simple man could even hope to draw. But his reflection was not one of the simple man. His arms were scarred and muscular, and his face seemed so much more masculine and mature. He went through a lot and became a true survivor, stronger and faster than any mortal man. The best ranger any human could hope to be. This one would not fail his friends. Dietrich saw something different. He saw himself back in Reichland with a ducal signet ring on his finger. He could feel it on his own hand as he gazed into the reflection and saw a man. A powerful man. Somebody respected and feared. Somebody who could change fates with a single spoken word, not a measly professor. When Fiona gazed upon her reflection, she was instantly enchanted by it. The woman in the mirror still had demonic features, but those only seemed to make her beautiful, even enthralling. And she was enthralling indeed. She saw so many people surrounding herself, admiring her, talking about her, reaching their hands to simply touch her. She was not merely accepted, she was beloved by all. But Eisen sees nothing. He already has everything he wants. A good axe, good comrades, the mirror could offer him nothing. He had it all and wanted no more. Eisen was so simple, he was incorruptible. <laughs> Return to monkey. It's like, return to adventurer. Return to simplicity. Following his gut instinct, he stepped forward, through the mirror, and disappeared. Gunnar truly wanted what he saw in his reflection, but he could achieve it with hard work, and he knew it. He smiled as he rejected the mirror's trick and followed Rise in his steps. Whatever Sir Gregor saw will forever remain a mystery, since he never shared his visions, but he rejected it too, leaving a few seconds after Gunnar. Only the Professor and the Tiefling remained enthralled and unable to refuse the illusion for what seemed like an eternity. Fiona was still looking at her perfect self, but by the minute her face grew sadder and sadder. It's true, when this adventure began, she just wanted to prove herself, to become a beloved figure, a fairy tale knight. But her adventure was not like a fairy tale, was it? It was dirt and blood and death and shit. Real people, ones she actually began caring for, have died and suffered. And for what? A cup. For 100 gold pieces. There'll be no perfect happy ending. There'll be no magic makeover. There'll be no knighthood. She'll be lucky if she comes out alive. Some dreams don't come true. It was her growing bitterness that allowed her to break free of the enchantment. Even she found it ironic. She looked around for someone to share it with, but then she froze in horror. Dietrich still stood beside her, yet his eyes were fixated on the mirror. He has succumbed absolutely. She tried to appeal to his common sense at first. Look at all those bodies, she said. They are all promised something by the mirror, yet here they lie lied to and dead. There was nothing the mirror could give to him. It was all a trick. And even if it could, would it really be worth it? But Dietrich remained unconvinced. Those were orcs and goblins, scum of the earth. They were probably too dense to even realize all the potential of the artifact. But he, he was a learned man, a professor. It could not trick him, only bribe. And this bribe he intends to take. No sense will convince him, she realized, as she changed her approach. The group needs him, she pleaded. They need a leader, someone wise, someone brave. The man who has led them so far is the only one who can lead them through. But that did not convince him either. You're a good woman, he said, no matter how you look. You'll be fine, you will make it. You can lead them if you want. You have the potential. Fiona looked upon her leader with desperation and panic, realizing that she was losing him. She pleaded, she promised and told him everything, even the eternal love and admiration, but nothing could move him at all. 
As tears started rolling down her cheeks, she suddenly realized what she must do, no matter how hard it will be. No words could save him, only deeds. So she took her flail into her hands and watched him wordlessly unsheath his sword. They rushed towards each other, and the steel sang. To say that the group was disturbed when Fiona came out of the gate, bleeding on the floor with every step and carrying the broken body of Dietrich Auerbach on her hands is to say nothing. He could not leave, she said weakly, only outside laying hands on the warrior and healing him back from his sorry state. Not when he was tempted, so I removed the temptation the only way I could. Upon waking up, Dietrich was no longer mesmerized by the trap, yet he was still bitter, as if by staying there he really could become a duke. In any case, they were both healed, and afterwards, they both silently agreed to never talk about what happened during the trial again. The trials were over, yet the undead still remained, infesting the ruins. Fiona's divine sense could clearly sense a few race in the banshee ahead, but there was something more. Something new, unheard of, something pure, something good, strange. First, however, they need to deal with the Banshee. It was Gunner who came up with the idea when he saw Fiona rumble through her personal belongings. Candles, they're made of wax, and that could be used to cover their ears. If no one could actually hear the Banshee scream, they could not be killed by it. The battle that followed was so simple and comical, you can probably imagine it by yourself. After some time spent trying to clear their ears from wax, the group proceeded further, only to come to a sudden halt. There was a giant feathered snake with bright rainbow scales right in front of them, and it spoke. Not only did the snake speak, but also spoke a lot and spoke sense, a rarity in this place. While the snake refused to tell us its name or master, it did mention that it was a servant of some higher power, sent here specifically to wait for us. Turns out, it's been expecting us, or someone like us, for hundreds of years. Those who would come for the covenant. Well, it's true, we did come here seeking the covenant. It was about time somebody explained to us what was going on and what this thing was about. Long story short, a great evil is contained near the Felucian Tree, an evil that cannot be defeated, but only imprisoned. However, its prison keeps growing weaker, and each time it's getting close to breaking out, the Covenant, a magic spell, had to be used to strengthen its bonds. Priestess Birolith, now known as the Night Hag Myrtle, sought to free the monster a long time ago, but she was foiled by someone, and now we're here to do it again. Aizen manages to find some bravery in him and protests that we never knew about the Covenant. It was all Talandil's business, and now she's dead. We came here for the Golden Cup. The snake freezes for a second, until it nods. Yes, the cup. He can sense that it's still under the Felucian Tree, but he warns us that nothing except for bitterness and disappointment will come out of it. Yes, we know that already. What we don't know, however, are two-thirds of the Covenant. The Quaddle assures us that there's no reason to worry. It's fully written down nearby. The death of our dwarf was fully pointless. Before we can leave, the Quaddle warns us about one more thing, something extremely important. The last word of the Covenant is not set in stone. It must be the reader's own name. With those words being said, he disappears into thin air. After all this panic about collecting the words in our missing bag, finding the words of the Covenant turns out to be so easy, it's almost a disappointment. They are literally written down on the wall in huge letters. Now we know the name of our enemy, the goal of our enemy, and have the means of foiling her plans, even though we don't really know why she is doing this. The perspective of letting out something so evil, ancient elves actually decided to imprison it instead of worshipping it, is terrifying. Now was the time of our revenge. Now we even know that it was Myrtle who kept sending horrible nightmares to Dietrich, robbing him of long rest benefits. In fact, knowing our enemy and the time of our final confrontation cheers the group up. Even Fiona stops brooding for a second and begins smiling again. 
She was wrong, she says. There will be a fairy tale ending. Good versus evil. It's time for the ultimate showdown. We will head to Felution and fight this witch, and no matter how deadly her magic is, we will strike her down. Now, with full knowledge of the Covenant, we will imprison her monster yet again. We will retrieve the cup, and then we will finally be free to go home. God knows we all miss it by now. With high hopes, we finally leave the caves and the elven city behind and head to the Felution tree, now clearly in our sights. Some legends say the Felution was once a golden tree higher than any tower. Its roots were as wide as the borders of the city Quillabrin and Insoon, and its leaves shined in the sun with every color of the rainbow. Nowadays, it didn't look that way. Black, ugly, and dead. Its naked branches were spreading around like fingers of a dying man, trying to grasp something with its last breath. Hundreds of ravens were sitting on it, watching us with scorn as we walked under the roots of the tree. She was there. They were all there. Hags and witches and their undead servants. All chanting and screeching in preparation for the sacrilegious ritual. It's over, Hazen yelled, calling their attention to our arrival. Myrtle glared at us. Her eyes were full of hatred and justified fear. Don't you dare to retreat, she called out to her coven as many of the witches began hastily retreating. Kill them all, now! The battle began. At first, Myrtle surrounded herself with an impenetrable shield, forcing us to deal with her minions first. The witches were weak, but their undead minions were peculiarly powerful, yet nothing we couldn't deal with. And then it began awakening. We all could see it, only a shadow, a silhouette at first. But as we continued the fight, its hideous body and all its eyes and tentacles started emerging from the other plane. Its presence was signaled by the dark mist that began covering almost half of the battlefield, shifting, moving, and changing shapes. Whatever stayed in the dark cloud quickly began withering and dying, and it only grew worse by the minute. All the while, Mirilith continued to be a threat. Her magic was deadly, yet even in close combat she could easily fight with eyes on equal ground. A creature of such power could not be defeated by our swords, so Dietrich began chanting words of the Covenant. In the end, when Mirrorless suffered the fatal blow, it was by Aizen's hand, amidst the choking black mist. But her end ultimately meant nothing. With each second, the creature from beyond kept growing more and more powerful. The mist became denser deadlier. They covered more and more ground, forcing the heroes to retreat again and again, choosing between getting slashed by the living dead or suffocated by the being's magic. Fiona, heavily wounded from her short-lived duel with Merilith, was forced to retreat all the way to the Felucian roots in order to heal herself. And that was the moment when the mists cut her off from her friends. She could not help them anymore, but neither could they help her. The dead were risen by the creature's presence, and they all headed towards the Felucian. The tiefling girl was the only thing in their way. The creature's power was far beyond summoning smoke and raising the dead. Its very gaze inflicted powerful curses upon the heroes. One, and Gunner was paralyzed in his place, watching as the mists approach him. Two, as Dietrich was burnt, he could not afford to scream. The Covenant was simply too important. 3. In horrified Aizen started turning the stone. As the heroes could only momentarily stun the creature, and Fiona could only keep the undead at bay for so long, everything depended on Dietrich's courage in the end. Despite the realization of horrible truth coming too late, he still finished his chant calmly looking at his comrades. Elitha gar terum olian tas in lestros kai nirlin Dietrich. There was a flash of light, and then there was thunder, and then it was over. The moment the black mist faded and the undead collapsed, Fiona rushed back inside. It could only mean one thing. The creature was driven back. Mirilith was dead. They have won. But as she gazed upon the battlefield, she saw the fruits of this victory. The ground was covered with many broken pieces of stone. Such was the final fate of Eisenreiser. 
Sir Gregor, the knight, the hero of Menelath, and a good man lied in the ground, lifeless. His body burned beyond recognition, boiled in his own armor. There was no trace of the savant by the name of Dietrich Arbeck. He disappeared, leaving behind absolutely nothing, not even ashes. Only Gunnar still stood on his feet, wounded but alive. With pain in his eyes, he too gazed upon what was left of his friends. Such was their victory over darkness. And their final reward, the golden cup, still shining, untouched by the ashes, the dirt, and the corruption. It lay beneath the Felucian tree, the reason it all began. Gunnar could only quietly, with a shaking voice, congratulate what was left from the group on their victory, such as it was. Fiona could not say a word at all, only sob. No one will ever believe in what happened here, nor would anyone care. Nobody asked the heroes to make the sacrifices they made, nor could anyone predict if they would choose to give their lives for this world, if they had a choice. But they deserved something for their heroism. That night, two graves were dug for those who had fallen against evil. And on the stone walls, such words were engraved. Here lie those who gave their lives for a better world. Dietrich Arbach, a professor from Drexenfurt. Eisen Riza, the brave warrior. And Sir Gregor Ironfist. The world will forget their sacrifice, but the stone will not. The two traveled back through the spider woods in silence. There was nothing to talk about. In the end... They've said simple goodbyes and wished each other luck. Gunnar's journey led him back to his homeland, in the north, to start anew. While he could not save his friends yet again, he took solace in saving some in the entire world. For the retrieval of the relic and her loyalty to the Order, Fiona was knighted upon returning to Greenwood. The loss of her friends took a toll on her, and her heart grew cold and bitter. Her new title of the Hero of the Spider Woods forever seemed like mockery to her. And thus, the story ends. The final conclusion to the Spider Woods. I hope you all enjoyed. If you like these stories and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to Neckbeardia. Click the bell icon and join the discords. If you like even more original stories, stop by Garbeardia for the Veil Rider series and the Emily Braun series. And I've got a discord too. It's not as, not as big as Neckbeardia's, but you know, I try. <laughs> So until I see you next time on this side of the veil in the next story, this has been Guard Bro, and this is Neckbeardia. <laughs>